Consumers want to know the facts about the products they buy, but America's agricultural landscape is not easy to navigate. Between different companies, scientific advancement, government regulations, advertisement campaigns, and an unhealthy amount of myth and misconception, anyone would be hard-pressed to make sense of it. That's where Real Ag comes in. Kyle Bauer and the Real Ag crew bring you truthful, unbiased information about real agricultural concerns. From the producers who make your food, to the store where you buy the final product, and everything in between. This is Real Ag. Now, here's your host, Kyle Bauer. It might have happened at a barbecue, or a fancy restaurant, or even at home, but we've all had that steak that just blows our mind. How is it that some steaks are better than others? Buying beef is our topic today on Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible by... The Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress powered by farmers. The beef industry is always looking to improve. Many studies have been made about consumers' buying habits. Consumers generally purchase products based on value or cost. Uh, appearance or color, and uh, generally leanness. What they should be looking for are things such as marbling, uh, also color. Uh, they want a nice bright cherry red color with their meat products, um, and something that's going to give them a good value for their dollar. So a lot of consumers are used to, especially with beef, it being bright cherry red. If it isn't, if it's more like brown where it's towards the end of its shelf life, consumers will more likely not um, purchase those things. Number two, probably, depending on the socioeconomic status of the consumer, will be the price. So we all, um, when I teach this in class, we, we always say um, students, for the most part, will look at pr the package price. They won't look at the pounds that are in the package or anything. So um, if it's $5.99, they can afford that, they'll end up buying it. Um, other things that, that consumers do look for are serving size has something to do with it. So if you're a single mom, um, and serving size is a, is a, uh, is a, is of importance to you because you don't want a lot of leftovers. Serving size will do it. And then um, probably the last thing or, or one of the last things at the actual meat counter that, that some consumers will look at will be, um, will be the management practices that those animals are raised in. For example, niche type markets, organic and natural raised animals. Um, they'll actually look for that and actually pay those premiums for those products. You're going to hear the word marbling a lot on this show. Let's figure out exactly what that is. In the steak, they look for marbling because marbling is where you get your flavor and more your tenderness rather than a real lean piece of meat. Marbling is intramuscular fat or fat between the muscle um, fibers uh, that shows up as little specks of white fat within the muscle. Uh, we, we often call marbling taste fat because it is where the species flavor comes from when we eat beef. And so the beefy flavor actually comes from that marbling we see in the product. What that does when it comes to the eating experience, well let's say from the cooking experience standpoint, is it's actually going to protect you a little bit from overcooking. And then when you're actually eating that product, it's going to provide you with some sort of juiciness. The other thing that it's going to that it's going to um, contribute to the muscle is it's actually going to contribute to tenderness because uh, fat once it's cooked will be less dense and your teeth will bite through it easier than if than if you're eating this through straight lean. So it's going to provide a tenderness experience. Generally speaking, the products with less marbling will have less flavor. Producers can increase the amount of marbling in their products uh, that that reach consumers uh, by several different uh, methodologies. One of those would be their breeding uh, scheme that they use. Uh, we know from many research trials that some cattle uh, have a higher uh, ability or a greater ability to marble uh, compared to other breeds. Uh, generally our British based breeds will have will marble better uh, than some of our say continental breeds or our uh, Brahmin or Bos Indicus uh, type breeding um, animals. So the other ways that we can do that is just by putting animals on a high concentrate diet or a grain fed diet. In order to get that marbling, we'll put our cattle into the feed lot to, to, to go through the finishing phase. And at that time, we'll feed high concentrate feeds that are high in, in starch and corn. And that will provide extra energy for that animal. And as the animal gets to the, to the top of its growth curve and it stops putting on muscle, 
it'll take the extra energy that it eats and put on fat. And so uh, producers mainly can manipulate that by um, the feeding strategy that they put their animals through. Uh, we need to have a high enough uh, amount or a large enough amount of, of energy in the diet to, to, uh, to deposit marbling. And uh, most diets without grain just don't have that. Producers can, can choose genetics in their cattle, uh, no matter what breed um, of, the, of the major breeds, and they can actually pick animals out of that genetic pool that have a higher propensity to marble. And so no matter whether you're using Hereford cattle or Angus cattle or Shorthorn cattle, uh, we have genetic uh, tools that we can select those animals that have a higher propensity to marble. The question is often asked, uh, why, don't, uh, why don't producers just pick animals that have a high propensity to marble uh, for their breeding stock? And the answer to that would be that there are several different environments here in the U.S. and, uh, and different feeding regimens that we, we use. Those, those genetic types of animals may not perform in those environments. The fat is where the marbling is. That is fat, and that's what you want. But a lot of times you have fat on the outside where if the critter went from, depends on, you know, on, the, you know, on the critter. It's like people, some people are fatter than others, you know, I mean, and that's the way it is on that, on that beef. And, but there you don't want too much on. You only want just enough to cover. But a lot of times I get them in where I have an inch of fat on that and I've trimmed that all off. Probably be the same, same uh, tissue, but the, the fat in the inside is where when you're cooking it, it breaks apart and it gets into your meat and it makes it more tender. Where on the outside, it just you just don't do nothing. It's just just grown off, you know. I mean, so you have to trim it off. Generally, external fat on the outside of a beef steak would not have a lot of um, effect on quality of that steak. Uh, some people like to eat the external portion of fat, and some people don't like that. Uh, don't like the external fat. So it's really up to the individual consumer on their preferences for external fat. You've seen words like choice and select on your meat. This is part of a grading scale set up by the United States Department of Agriculture. So if I was to go into the grocery store and buy beef, I am usually gonna look for the actual grade of the animal or the quality grade of the animal. For the USDA quality grading system that we use to grade beef, the quality grades are prime choice, select, and standard. And so, when we think about where, where do those products go, our higher quality products, such as Prime, generally those go to high-end steakhouse, such as Roos Chris Steakhouse um, would be the, probably the largest national chain that has that product. Um, you usually see those in white tablecloth steakhouses. Um, very rarely will you see Prime steaks sold in the, in the actual uh, commercial setting or, or the actual grocery store setting unless you can maybe order them in. Um, so Prime's gonna be the, the tops and, and and cost you the most so it's going to be um, the most expensive and, and it's going to provide you with the best eating experience. After that you can probably separate them into high choice or upper two-thirds choice. Actually the, the upper two-thirds uh, portion of choice uh, mostly goes to branded programs such as a certified Angus beef brand will pull a lot of product out and then here recently uh, Walmart has, uh, has uh, developed the market for what they call their steakhouse brand. And so that's an upper uh, two-thirds choice product. Uh, when we think more of our commodity products, we think more of our low choice or bottom end of choice. And that's probably what you're gonna find at most major uh, grocery stores. And so as we're going down in the quality grade scale, we're just reducing the amount of marbling within that muscle and all the positive of, of attributes that marbling um, contributes to the eating experience. Some grocery stores will stock select products but uh, most of those will, most of our retailers will not stock standard products. And so standard being the lowest quality grade generally goes into food service. And many times those products all have to be marinated or uh, seasoned so that they have uh, a better flavor profile uh, due to the lack of marbling. And like for all my steaks, my, my primal steaks are all choice, but like uh, the cheaper steaks, they're select. Marbling, I mean, select. Selects doesn't have near as much marbling and it won't be quite as tender. So quality grade is also um, uh, also conducted through the, the, the USDA or United States Department of Agriculture. And these guys are actually um, a paid for service 
that that is a third party service that will actually grade the quality of those animals. So there's a USDA um, grader that will be on on the line in the plant, and once the carcass is ribbed, they'll sit there and observe the maturity, and they'll also observe the actual marbling, the two uh, two main components of of quality grade, and uh, and assign a grade to those uh, to those carcasses so we can um, sell them in the marketplace. Quality grade is an actual measure or it's predicting the eating experience that that consumer is going to experience in the, uh, at, the, at the time of cooking and consumption. And so, uh, so there are two factors that go into quality grade. First is the actual age of the animal, which we can either determine by dentition. You can also determine it if you keep good records and you know the actual age of the animal. And then they also do it by the actual ossification of the uh, skeletal structure of that animal. The second factor that goes into it is the actual marbling, the fat within the muscle. Packers pay the, uh, the producer based on quality grade. And so uh, the more marbling we can get into the animal, uh, the better off that the, they will get paid. So that's the current market signals that we have now. Now you, the USDA grading system is, is conducted by the Ag Market Service, and that is a voluntary um, uh, program not, not paid for by tax dollars uh, that the packers pay for in order to market their products. Inspection and grading are two different things. Grading is going to tell you the actual quality of the product, how good it's going to be. Inspection is going to tell you the wholesomeness. So in order for any meat product, and even if we're going to talk about pork and chicken, but any meat product sold within the United States to a consumer has to be federally inspected. There's a government agency that will, that will um, observe the everyday operations of the plant to make sure that the product produced is as wholesome and, uh, and safe as possible. Some people prefer lean beef. How is lean beef produced? The advantages of uh, choosing lean uh, steak uh, over those that are maybe highly marbled would uh, be the obvious uh, decrease in, in calories that you would get from having a product that's mostly mostly protein uh, in water compared to uh, one that's say 15 or 20 percent fat. So those that are on a uh, restricted di an energy restricted diet, maybe if they have uh, weight issues or maybe if there are some uh, heart issues or, or those kind of things. Consumers might ask the question, what does lean mean when we talk about uh, beef steak. And USDA defines lean as less than 10 grams of fat uh, per 100 milligram or per 100 gram serving with less than four and a half uh, grams of that coming from saturated fat. And so uh, there are lots of consumers out there that are looking for a lean uh, meat alternative uh, due to health concerns or just that they're health conscious. So we have several branded beef programs that actually focus on that. Uh, Laura's Lean Beef would be one of those. Uh, and that those products actually are pretty devoid of marbling. Uh, they don't have a lot of marbling in them. And so they rely on just the, the inherent tenderness of the product to be a, a, a good eating experience for the consumer. Genetics can play a role in it. If an animal is pre predisposed not to have not to deposit a lot of fat, their carcass may end up just having no marbling or little marbling in it, so that's a lean product. Um, the producer can manipulate it by actually that diet. Um, if they don't feed a diet that's really high in starch, if they keep their animals on grass for most of its life, it's going to take it longer. It's going to be harder for, it, for that animal to have extra dietary energy to be to put into to fat development and actually into marbling, and so that's how you can actually have a leaner type steak. Some folks might uh, ask, well, how can you get a, a product that's, that's extremely lean but yet tender? And the answer to that is those several breed associations keep track of the shear force or the amount of, uh, amount of force it takes to chew a piece of meat, and they're actually selecting genetics that have more tender meat. Okay, so if a producer is, is producing a product in a traditional conventional beef uh, raising setting or beef production setting, uh, what they can do is, is supplement growth technologies, whether it would be an ear implant or actually feed additives that will actually direct nutrients away from fat development into muscle development so you get more muscle over fat and that will produce a leaner type steak. The, the most powerful um, thing that they can do is choose the right breeds of cattle. Uh, many of our continental uh, breeds that come from continental Europe 
uh, are very heavy muscled. Uh, Limousine, Charlet, Simital, those would be breeds uh, that would be very lean. Um, and so choosing those breeds of cattle would be the first step. There is a very important quality in beef, tenderness. How is a tender piece of beef achieved? The actual consumer eating experience, they're gonna look for, for three main, main things. Number one, and the most important, is gonna be tenderness. The second one is going to be um, juiciness, and fat will contribute to that, marbling will contribute to that, so that's why if I'm at the grocery store, I'll look for a more highly marbled steak. And then the third one will be the actual flavor of the, of the steak, and that's what the consumers are, when they're actually eating that product, are gonna consider when they d decide whether they had a pleasurable eating experience or not. Most consumers would probably think that, you know, beef's just tender, there's not really much that goes into it. That's a lot of what um, a lot of the beef industry has contributed a lot of research towards that. Um, some of it has to do with connective tissue, and with that, the age of the animal will factor into that. So most of the animals that we eat are very young in their life cycle, or in their natural life cycle. So the age of the animal, so as the animals get older, their muscles will become more tough. Well, in the beef line, what I look for is dates when they come in because that's what makes your tenderness is by aging the beef. Generally speaking, we, we would like to see at least 14 days of aging on the product after slaughter. And some people would tell you that up to 21 days would, is, is beneficial. Aging is a process where we take a whole cell cut of meat. And let's say for most consumers, we're familiar with the actual ribeye steak or the rib and the loin or, or your Kansas City steak or our uh, New York strip steak. And so what they do is they take those whole muscles and they'll put them into two different types of, of aging methods. The first is wet aging, and what that involves is putting the actual uh, muscle in a, in a vacuum package bag. We suck all the air out and we leave it there for, I think the, it, it varies between, I think now in the industry, between 14 and 21 days. And at that point, what we're allowing um, to occur within the muscle are natural enzymes there to break down the muscle fibers. And what that ends up doing is making the steak more tender for the consumer. The second type of aging is dry aging and what we do there, and you'll usually see this method in specialty white tablecloth steak houses. Uh, um, and what we do there is we will put the actual muscle on a rack. It can be on a, also just hanging from a, what we call a meat tree or just hanging from a, a a little meat hook and uh, and it'll be hanging there it can range anywhere from 28 to 60 days um, and, and I've even heard people do it 90 days and, and the longer the better um, and so what so what that does is that also causes tenderization through the same process as weight aging but it also causes uh, an intense flavor development because you concentrate those flavors by drying out the muscle um, and it's a totally different product from the standpoint of taste. Now both methods, tenderness-wise, produce the same tenderness profile, but the actual difference in the two is the actual flavor profile. The enzymes located in meat that, that break down the muscle fibers are no different than any other enzymes. They must be held above freezing, and generally they'll work faster as the product is heated. And so if we freeze the product, we won't get any aging to occur. Generally, most folks hold the product between 32 and 36 degrees Fahrenheit. The aging process and uh, the, way it's pro the way it's cooked, that's the way it's cooked is 50% and the aging is 50% of, of tenderness. You generally get what you pay for. Uh, the steaks that are most expensive, such as the tenderloin, they are generally the most tender steaks that you can buy. And so as price goes down, generally tenderness will go down as well. And so uh, as you look at a, a typical retail outlet, you'll, tenderloins will be the most expensive, followed by ribeyes, followed by strip loins. Um, then of course you can get into your, some of your chuck steaks and then into your round steaks. And so they would be uh, most tender to least tender in that list. You've heard a lot of information so far, but how do we know all this? It turns out beef production has a lot of science behind it. At Kansas State University, we use a lot of analytical tools to look at beef quality. One of those analytical tools we use is the Warner Bratzer shear force measurement. In that uh, shear force, we actually cook a sample and we, will, we actually shear it uh, across the muscle fiber 
to determine what the peak force is necessary to shear the sample. And what that does is it somewhat mimics uh, the actual uh, chewing action of the human, uh, human teeth. And so we can get an analytical measurement that's very repeatable uh, that we can use in our analysis of different uh, meat products. We do a lot of meat research here at K-State. And in that research, we generally look at sensory traits of beef, pork, and lamb is, is generally the species we'll work with. And in those sensory analysis um, sessions, we actually have individual panelists that will rank each meat product that they eat uh, in a blind um, taste test format. And basically they'll look at three main factors, those being tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. And so we can quantitatively uh, value the, the quality of each meat product uh, based on actual human, um, human subjects. The panelists are trained so that we can get a repeatable answer uh, from sample to sample. The types of trials that we conduct here at K-State look at all different phases of, of production when it comes to quality. So we may be looking at different nu nutritional strategies. Uh, we may be looking at new uh, growth promoting technologies. Uh, we may also be looking at uh, different breeds of animals. And so what we will do is we will design studies where we will put them on feed in, in a controlled environment and actually test those, um, test those parameters uh, by using our sensory analysis, uh, uh, our sensory analysis center here at K-State, as well as we will also look at the physical attributes of the product, such as how much marbling they have, uh, what's the shear force uh, values that they have, uh, what kind of cook loss do we exhibit on those products? So there are numerous muscle biologists at the universities throughout the uh, throughout the country, and especially and and to change that throughout the world. Um, and so the point of I think most of our programs is to actually explain the biology behind meat quality. For example, why is what in the muscle is making meat tough? Whether it be collagen, the actual muscle fiber. Uh, um, and so that's kind of what we look at. A big thing too when it involves muscle color, um, looking at the actual um, biochemistry of that muscle or the, the metabolism of the muscle because your muscles will have different metabolisms. And based on that, you can either have a very good shelf life where the color will last a long time or you can have a very poor shelf life where the color won't last very long. And so we kind of use molecular techniques. We use microscopes and other tools to actually explain meat quality. and, and try to improve meat quality too because once you understand the thing I always try to tell people that when I'm explaining the importance of my program if you're going to understand the bio biology of the muscle you can actually start to try to manipulate it to your advantage you know and I'm not saying we can make the most tender steak in the world but you can actually try to make minor improvements that will benefit producers and the consumer. Everyone is concerned with the ethical treatment of animals. Are beef cattle treated humanely? The meat packing industry um, is a very humane process by necessity. Packers use humane handling procedures in order to bring the highest quality products to, the, to consumers. The reason for that is that any type of uh, excitation or uh, poor animal handling uh, will result in products such as dark cutters, uh, which, which have dark lean that's, that's uh, objectionable to consumers. Um, they also, it also has uh, negative effects on yield and can affect tenderness of, of meat products. So it's in the packer's best interest uh, to handle, handle the animals as humanely as possible. And so the way that, that most um, harvest facilities and, and, and producers will handle their animals is, um, is very humanely and, and by designing facilities that will, that will facilitate the ease of movement for their animals. So if we're talking about the gathering pin when we start to put the animals in the single file line, um, it'll have a round type tub or a round corner so the animals can gently go around corners and not be so scared because usually if an animal is walking up to a 90 degree turn if you're trying to shift them to let's say to the right or the left and it's a 90 degree turn they'll usually balk which involves you having to either prod them um, um, kind of stick them with a stick or, or kind of aggressively handle them which happens sometimes and so to prevent that all packing facilities have their design where their animals are um, 
are handled with the most care and the, the, the most ease of movement for those animals and, and actually designed to where those animals will, will move naturally and what's most comfortable for them. Um, the other thing that plants usually do is they only have a certain um, set of workers that are trained in humane handling and these are the only workers that are allowed to work with those animals. Um, and, and basically, if you go around all plants in the United States, is a zero tolerance policy for abuse. You know, anybody gets caught doing that and, then, and they're probably finding a new job the next day. So, um, so animal handling is the, the most paramount thing in, in the industry. When animals arrive at the plant, they're usually allowed a rest period to allow them to get acclimated to the actual area. Because when the animals come off their truck, they're usually in a heightened state of awareness because they're in a new, new area. So most plants will put them in the pen with their with the their uh, with the animals that came with them, allow them time to rest and actually drink water and, and kind of rest before they go on to be harvested. There you have it. The experts have told you what to look for. Now you're on your way to being an expert yourself. On behalf of the Real Ag crew, I'm Kyle Bauer, and this has been Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible by. The Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by farmers.